Hi, Bill Federer here. In this episode of How We Got Here, we're going to look at AI, artificial intelligence. You may have seen movies like Johnny Five in Short Circuit or The Matrix with Kano Reeves or Will Smith in I, Robot or WALL-E or Avengers Age of Ultron. To understand AI, let's look at the origin of computing. In Mesopotamia, around 2500 BC, they used an abacus or a counting frame with rods and beads that slid back and forth to represent numerical values. This was a thousand years before the invention of the Hindu Arabic numeral system that eventually turned into the numbers that we use today. Another invention was in 1714, the chronometer or a clock with gears. It revolutionized sea navigation. It was a necessary improvement over pendulum clocks, which were unreliable due to the swaying of a ship. A navigator would use a chronometer and an instrument called a sextant, meaning 60 degrees, to look at the angle of the sun from the deck of the ship at precisely the same time every day to determine the ship's longitude. Beginning in 1760, the Industrial Revolution harnessed steam to run engines in textile factories with large mechanized gears. These machines were adapted to count the revolutions of a wheel. Next, Charles Babbage, considered the father of the computer, developed an analytical engine with lots of gears for calculations. In 1879, James Ritty, a saloon keeper in Ohio, invented the cash register. He got the idea while in an ocean liner in the engine room, seeing a mechanism count the revolutions of the propeller. A cash register allows you to push a key, which turns a gear representing a penny. When that gear turned 10 notches, it would turn another gear representing a dime, and so on and so forth. The National Cash Register Company spread this around the country. Next were voting machines in 1875. These big metal contraptions with gears, you could push a key representing a candidate and it would tabulate the vote count. Ironically, no sooner did mechanical voting machines get put into place than cheaters found a way to take off the back and alter the gears and steal votes. Then there was the player piano, which used a roll of paper with holes punched in it to uh, cause a piano to hit keys making music. John McTammony in 1890 adapted this to create punch cards to cast votes in voting machines. And instead of powered by spring, it was powered by pressurized air. Herman Hollerith invented recording data on punch cards, which could be stored and then read in other machines. Now using electricity, rather than springs or pressured air. They're called electromechanical tabulating machines with tiny on-off switches. Letters were given numerical values of long combinations of zeros and ones, which allowed for letters to be put into the computer and the creation of word processing. The computer tabulating company was renamed IBM. In 1958, Texas Instruments invented the microchip, which stored electronic data, in, not in punch cards, but as electronic charges. This was called machine code. Then Windows was invented, which turned machine, machine code into images. Then the World Wide Web was invented, allowing computers to share data over the internet. Then search engines such as Google could access all the computers hooked up to the internet and quickly pull up information for your search results. Individuals with computers now had unlimited free communication and access to unprecedented amounts of information. And then social media came along where personal information and pictures were shared. An era opened up of communication taken away from wealthy corporate newspaper, television, and radio networks. Human nature, though, does not change. And some students 
use the internet to plagiarize their homework assignments. Then real-time audio and video could be shared. It did not occur to anyone that sharing information on the internet was a two-way street. Not only could you view information, but the internet companies could keep track of what you were viewing. They could gather information of what you purchased and what you like to view and who you communicate with and every website you visit and how many seconds you are viewing each web page, every Instagram and every YouTube that you watch, every Google search that you do. And they sell this information to marketing companies so they can do targeted advertising and having ads pop up on your phone or computer of what they know that you like because they've been watching you. And now with your iPhones and satellites, they can track everywhere you go and who you come in contact with and how long you are with that person. And then with Siri and Alexa, they're constantly listening to hear their names called, but they're constantly listening to everything you say, even when you're not using the app. Global companies analyze this data to feed you more of what you like so that you'll stay online longer. Every phone, computer, and smart device that accesses the internet has an ID. So they build a profile on you of what you like and don't like, your pleasures, your fears, and then they run algorithms to manipulate you, not just to get you to buy a product, but now to alter your political and moral views. Then add in psychology. They've discovered that humans are social creatures who want to be accepted and don't want to be rejected. This is so powerful that some children who felt cyber bullied committed suicide. Then there's politics. President Obama signed in 2016 the Countering Foreign Propaganda and Disinformation Act, which allows the federal government to monitor everyone's social media and communications for national security purposes, which has morphed into political agenda purposes. Campaigns sway your views by populating your inbox and search results with posts favoring one ideological view and censoring, canceling, or blocking others. Social media companies boast of how they influenced voters' perception of the candidates. We may have experienced our last human election uninfluenced by AI. Add to all this supercomputers. Instead of conventional computers, which use bits of digital information stored in two positions, one and zero, supercomputers use quantum bits or qubits, which can exist in many states simultaneously. The more qubits that are entangled, the more processing speed increases exponentially. They now can do a billion billion operations per second. These $100 million machines are kept near absolute zero so the atoms do not vibrate. And these supercomputers use AI to perform complex algorithms to analyze enormous amounts of data that's constantly changing complicated variables in order to make predictions. Dr. Dario Gill, IBM Senior Vice President and Director of Research stated, quantum computing has the power to transform nearly every sector and help us tackle the biggest problems of our time. Quantum computers collect insanely vast amounts of data on any topic and can assemble it immediately in a unique way. It can be used for students to write papers or financial and investment predictions or with programs like ChatGPT, instantly create customized artwork, videos, music, and even entire movies. They are able to do problem solving with multiple changing variables, probability, chance, prediction, even predicting human behavior. Artificial intelligence, or AI, can now learn and teach itself. With access to all the information on the internet, there is fear of it being smarter than humans. In 1997, a computer named Deep Blue defeated the world chess champion Gary Kasparov by learning his moves. In 2017, 
Google's AlphaGo computer, defeated KG, China's champion of the complicated strategy game Go. AI computers calculate every possible move that the player could make, study the player's past patterns, and then predict what moves the player will make. One example is after an AI computer was taught one language, it automatically taught itself to learn other languages all on its own. Now, AI computers can pass SAT tests, bar exams, medical exams. It can analyze and recognize photos and pictures and then recreate them. Every advancement in technology is a two-edged sword. It can be used for good or evil. It has been demonstrated that AI can have a bias, pushing an agenda by presenting some views positively and others negatively. A political campaign used AI to produce a commercial smearing an opponent, having him artificially portrayed as embracing an un unpopular person. This is called deep fake. It can take just a couple seconds of you talking to be able to recreate your voice and image exactly. One malicious use of this is high-tech scammers. A scammer using AI made a random phone call to a girl's cell phone. When she answered, it recorded a few seconds of her voice and then called her mother and with the AI-generated daughter's voice, frantically said she had been kidnapped and that the mom should immediately wire money to the kidnappers. The IRS announced it will use AI to try to audit more citizens and make them pay more in taxes. The military agency called DARPA uses AI. This poses an interesting problem as nations are in a quantum supremacy arms race with lethal autonomous robotic weapons. AI is not controlled by any one country as it's on the world wide web. The question is, will humans be able to control it? In one simulation, an AI drone was tasked to destroy a target. When the operator told it to abort, it viewed the operator as preventing it from accomplishing its mission. So it attempted to destroy and fire upon the operator. Once fringe climate change alarmists advocating reducing the world's population, now that governments and globalist billionaires have embraced these depopulationist views, there is fear that AI will be employed to view humans as a threat to the world and somehow wanna reduce the world's population. Some see a possible correlation with Revelations 13. And I beheld another beast and he had power to give life into the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and force all great and small, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their hand and on their forehead so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark. Well, lest we get in fear, we have to remind ourselves that God created you and he knows all your thoughts and your imaginations from the inside. First Chronicles 28, 9, for the Lord searches all hearts and understandeth all imaginations. Uh, Psalms 94, 11, the Lord knows the thoughts of man, but Satan is not God. He does not know your thoughts, but he wants to be like God. Isaiah 14, 14 says, Satan said, I will be like the most high. So from the outside in, he's trying to learn your thoughts. Could it be that the devil would want to influence sinful men to use AI to study our thoughts and try to deceive us? We may not know the future, but we know who holds the future and he loves you. First John 4.18 says, perfect love casts out fear. When we remind ourselves that God loves you, he created you, he wants to spend eternity with you, you can face the future without fear. The Bible is full of times that looked pretty bad, and God raised up little nobodies who are small in their own eyes, but big in faith and courage to do great things. I hope this has been an interesting episode on AI. God bless you.